Good morning. Thank you for coming uh, to the first Monday Speaker Series uh, this month. Please come on in and grab a seat if you're still waiting out in the back. Um, please do silence your cell phones. I was checking that on the way up here, so please do that if you haven't done that already. Um, a quick story to start. So last spring, uh, I was at a, a national conference sort of covering all the hot button topics uh, facing the Christian church today. So, you know, gay marriage, religious liberty, international missions, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, There's over a thousand people there, uh, all of them sort of there because they wanted to think about the present and the future of the church. And, and of those thousand people, I bet none of them had seriously thought about Native Americans within the context of the church. None out of a thousand. And within nine minutes, every single person there was thinking seriously about that topic and would continue to think to do so long after the conference had ended. So what happened in those nine minutes? Mark Charles. Mark Charles is what happened in those nine minutes. So the mission of the First Monday Speaker Series is to bring thinkers, writers, and cultural leaders to Dort College to discuss with the campus and broader community ideas that will stretch our imaginations, grow our understanding, and help us form and reform our world in God-honoring ways. Our speaker today will stretch us and ask us to grow. He's a licensed pastor who has served on the Board of Trustees for the Christian Reformed Church of North America and the Christian Community Development Association. He's the founder of Five Small Loaves, an organization pursuing racial reconciliation and the renewal of church missions. And he blogs regularly at Wireless Hogan. He is one of our nation's leading voices articulating the need for First Nations reconciliation. And as Christians caught up in God's plan for the reconciliation of all things, we cannot ignore any area of our contemporary lives that cries for such reconciliation. Today, we have the privilege of sharing our campus with one such person crying for such reconciliation. He will challenge us to think about how deeply sin penetrated the very roots of this country and how we should respond to that as contemporary Christians. So please join me in welcoming to Door College and to this stage, Mark Charles. Yate. Yate. Mark Charles, you know, yeah. Sin bake the nan the slant to toy guni bashin, sin bake the nan bashche, do to the chini bashinella. My name is Mark Charles. My father is Navajo and my mother is American of Dutch heritage. And in the Navajo culture, when you introduce yourself, you always give your four clans. So we're a matrilineal society, and so our identities come from our mother's mother. So um, my mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and so when I introduce myself, I say Tsinbeke de Ne'e, which literally translated means the wooden shoe people. <laughs> my father's mother, my second clan, is Toa Higlini, which is the waters that flow together. My mother's father, my third clan, is also Tsinbeke de Ne'e, and my father's father is Toa Chitni, which is the Bitterwater clan, one of the original clans of our Navajo people. Um, my father actually attended college here, I don't know what year, um, before they had color televisions but, uh, and pay phones. But um, anyway, so my, my family actually has a history here at Dort College, and I've had the privilege of building relationship with some of the faculty and, and some students here. I believe I actually have some nieces and nephews in the audience somewhere here. Um, I won't make you raise your hand until after I speak and you see how I did. But... Um, I want to talk to you today about a topic that is going to make all of you squirm. I want to present a history that most of you have never heard of. And I need to warn you, what you're going to hear me say today is going to traumatize you. It's going to make you angry. 
you're going to feel defensive, you're going to want to shout or throw something at me. And I want to warn you of this beforehand because this is a conversation that we need to have. We have to find a way to have this dialogue, and so I want to encourage you to stay in the conversation. You're going to be tempted even to walk out. Don't. Stay in the conversation. We're going to get to a place where we can actually begin to deal with this, but first we have to get through some pretty rough stuff to get to that point. Invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever, and other enemies of Christ wheresoever placed, and the kingdoms, dukedoms, principalities, dominions, possessions, and all movable and immovable goods whatsoever held and possessed by them, and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, and to apply and appropriate to himself and his successors the kingdoms, dukedoms, counties, principalities, dominions, possessions, and goods, and to convert them to his and their use and profit. Anyone know who I'm quoting here? These are the words of Pope Nicholas V, who wrote a papal bull, or an official edict of the papal of the Catholic Church, in 1452. This papal bull and others like it, written in the 1450s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and the last one written in 1493, collectively became known as what is called the Doctrine of Discovery. The Doctrine of Discovery is essentially this series of papal bulls, that is the church in Europe, saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever lands you find not ruled by Christian rulers, those people are less than human, and the land is yours for the taking. It was the doctrine of discovery that allowed European nations to go into Africa, colonize the continent, and enslave the African people. It was the same doctrine of discovery that allowed Christopher Columbus to get lost at sea, land in a continent inhabited by millions, and claim to have discovered it. Because his doctrine told him we weren't people, and therefore the land was empty. A few years later, these words were written down. He has endeavored to prevent the populations of these states for that purpose, obstructing the laws of naturalization for foreigners and refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither and raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. In 1763, King George drew a line down the Appalachian Mountains, and he essentially said to the colonists, you no longer have the right of discovery of all Indian lands west of Appalachia. That right now belongs solely to the crown. This upset the colonies, the colonists. So they wrote a letter of protest, and this is part of that letter where they ended by saying he has raised the conditions of new appropriations of land. They go on in the same letter and accuse the king and say he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Anyone know what letter this is I'm talking about? It was signed on July 4, 1776. And the first few lines state that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Very few people read the entire declaration. Because if they did, they would learn that 30 lines below the statement, all men are created equal, the Declaration of Independence dehumanizes natives by calling us merciless Indian savages. A few years later, these colonists wrote another document. And in this document, they stated that representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union, according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed, and three-fifths of all other persons. Anyone know what document this is? This is the Constitution of the United States. Article 1, Section 2 states that natives are specifically excluded from this union and African people are counted as three-fifths of a person. Now you may say, but wait, didn't we correct that? Yes, we did. 
less than 100 years later with the passing of the 14th Amendment, which extended the right of citizenship to all persons born on this land under the jurisdiction of the government, which allowed African slaves to become citizens, but still excluded natives from citizenship because our allegiance apparently was to our tribes and not to the government. But what people forget is that in the 1970s, the same amendment, the 14th Amendment, was reinterpreted. And now it was used to proclaim that unborn babies aren't human, and therefore they can be aborted. What this demonstrates is that the heart of our Constitution is not a value for life, but a practice of dehumanization and a value for exploitation and profit. A few years later, these words were written down. As they, the European colonizing nations, were all in pursuit of nearly the same object, it was necessary in order to avoid conflicting settlements and consequent war with each other to establish a principle by which all should acknowledge as the law by which the right of acquisition, which they all asserted, should be regulated as between themselves. This principle was that discovery gave title to the government by whose subjects or by whose authority it was made against all other European governments, which title might be consummated by possession. Anyone know who said this? This was the United States Supreme Court. In 1823, a court case, Johnson versus McIntosh, two men of European descent in litigation over a piece of land. One bought the land from a native tribe, the other bought it from the government. They want to know who owned it. In reviewing the case, the court essentially stated that based on the doctrine of discovery, natives only have the right of occupancy to land, like a fish occupies water or a bird occupies air, while Europeans have the right of discovery to the land and therefore true title to it. This case, along with a few others, became the precedent for land titles within the United States. This precedent and the doctrine of discovery was referenced by the United States Supreme Court as recently as 2005. Now that we have an understanding of this racist doctrine of discovery and the way it has foundationally influenced our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, and our Supreme Court cases, now we have to take a look at this slew of history that came as a result of having built these systemically racist institutions on these very racist foundations. In 1830, our country passed the Indian Removal Act. This was an act that allowed Congress to forcibly remove natives from their lands in the east to more open lands further to the west. This act allowed for the 1838 Trail of Tears for the Cherokee, as well as the 1864 Long Walk for the Navajos. Many nations, including the Chickasaw, the Shawnee, the Lenape, the Osage, the Kickapoo, the Choctaw, the Seminole, the Cree, the, the Saw, the Fox, and the Dakota, all experienced forced relocations. Tens of thousands of people died when they were rounded up for these relocations. Thousands and thousands more died along the way. And thousands also died in the relocation areas because they were often moved to lands that were not sustainable for living and for farming and for raising families. A few years later, this order was given. Ordered that the Indians and half-breeds sentenced to be hanged by the military commission composed of Colonel Crooks, Lieutenant Colonel Marshall, Captain Grant, Captain Bailey, and Lieutenant Olin, and lately sitting in Minnesota, you caused to be executed on Friday, the 19th day of December, the following names to wit. Cases 2, 4, 5, 6, 10, 11, 12, 14, 15, 19, 22, 24, 35, 67, 68, 69, 70, 96, 115, 121, 138, 155, 170, 175, 178, 210, 225, 264, 254, 264, 279, 318, 327, 333, 342, 359, 373, 377, 382, and 383. 
Anyone know who gave this order? Yes. On December 26th of 1862, by order of President Abraham Lincoln, 38 Dakota warriors were hung after mock trials that lasted mere minutes. This was the largest mass execution in the history of the United States of America. In November of 1864, we had the Sand Creek Massacre. Nearly 200 Cheyenne and Arapaho men, women, and children were encamped over a hill. They were waving a white flag of surrender and an American flag to show they were there peacefully. An army came over the hill and essentially slaughtered everybody in that encampment. Just a few months ago, Ned Blackhawk of the New York Times described this battle in this way. In terms of pure, pure horror, a few events matched Sand Creek. Pregnant women were murdered and scalped, and genitalia were paraded as trophies. In 1879, our Congress passed the Boarding School Act. This was an act that allowed the government and the churches to forcibly take Native students from their homes and put them in military-style boarding schools. The stated purpose of these boarding schools came from Captain Richard Henry Pratt, who said that all the Indian there is in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. In these boarding schools, Native students were, were punished for speaking their language. Native students were taken from their homes and they were raised away from their families. They were um, forbidden from practicing their culture, from being with their, with their relatives. Anyone here ever been to Rehoboth School in New Mexico? Rehoboth Christian School was one such boarding school. It operated as a boarding school until the 1970s. In 1887, Congress passed the Dawes Allotment Act. This act stated that every male over age 18 was allotted 160 acres of land. Now that the expansion had happened, the government still wanted to open up more land in the West. And so they allotted 160 acres to every male over 18 and opened up the rest of the land to white settlers. What this did is over the next 50 years, it allowed native land holdings to reduce by two-thirds, roughly a landmass the size of California. There's a lake up in northern Minnesota in the Fond du Lac Reservation. It's called Big Lake. If you go to the lake, about a third of the lake has a, a native tribal center, a powwow grounds, and a campground, and the rest of the lake has houses around it. I was with an elder of that community, and I said, how come there are so many non-natives living on the shores of your lake in the middle of your reservation? He said, that's the Dawes Allotment Act. When they opened up lands for white settlement, they gave the best lands to the white settlers and gave the, the rest of the scraps to the native peoples. In 1890, we had the massacre at Wounded Knee. Lakota Chief Bigfoot and 350 followers of his were massacred at Wounded Knee in a one-day battle. This battle is a little more famous. People have heard about it, but most people don't know that 20 Congressional Medals of Honor were given to the people, who to the, the U.S. soldiers who participated in this massacre. And to date, every effort to have these medals rescinded has been rebuffed. In 1890, or 1924, we passed the Indian Citizenship Act. This act extended citizenship to all non-Indian citizens of the United States. However, because voting is a state's right, most states, or several states, excluded Natives from voting until as late as 1948. Two of the states that were the last to allow Native Americans to vote were New Mexico and Arizona, which finally opened up voting in 1948. This is a key date because in 1942, the United States of America entered World War II. And they soon recruited dozens of Navajo young men into the, the armed services and asked them to develop a code. They became known as the Navajo Code Talkers and developed a code that is widely attributed to helping our nation win the battle in the Pacific. They developed a code that was never once broken. And yet at the time they were recruited, they didn't even have the right to vote. On December 19, 2009, President Obama signed House Resolution 3326. This was the 2010 Department of Defense Appropriations Act. 
It was a 67-page document laying out the appropriations for the DOD for 2010. On page 45, subsection 8113 is titled, Apology to Native Peoples of the United States. What follows is a seven-bullet point apology. It mentions no specific tribe, no specific treaty, and no specific injustice. It essentially says you had some nice land, our citizens didn't take it very politely, let's just call it our land and steward it together. To date, this apology has never been announced, read, or publicized by the White House or by Congress. And it ends with a disclaimer stating that nothing in this is legally binding. So what kind of effect does this history have? What does this type of history do to communities that were oppressed? In most minority communities, we have a term that's called historical trauma. Historical trauma refers to this multi-generational trauma that comes particularly to people of oppressed and victimized communities. Um, it's used to describe kind of this dissatisfaction with life and the, the, the stressors that they, they struggle with throughout their lives and throughout their, their existence. Often, this term is used to refer to Native Americans and to African American communities. Now, there have been papers and reports and speeches, and there's a lot of material out there about historical trauma and the impact this, this has had on our communities of color all throughout the nation. But I don't want to talk about the historical trauma this morning. I want to talk about a different trauma. I want to talk about the effect of what happens when you build a nation on 500 years of dehumanizing injustice. And you cannot build a nation on 500 years of dehumanizing injustice without causing trauma to yourself, without traumatizing the dominant. I want to talk today about the trauma of white America and the impact that this history has had upon the dominant culture of our country. Trauma has many symptoms, but almost every definition of trauma and a list of symptoms for trauma include denial, fear, misdirection, an inability to cope with the present reality. The APA calls it, immediately after the event, shock and denial are typical. The Mayo Clinic says the symptoms are trying to avoid thinking, are talking about the traumatic event, avoiding places and activities or people that remind you of the event. Overwhelming guilt or shame, always being on guard for danger are other emotional symptoms. Royal Park Hospital says shock, constant fear, denial, and disbelief are symptoms of trauma. Helpguide.org says shock, denial, and disbelief, guilt, shame, self-blame, anxiety, and fear are all symptoms of trauma. The Trauma Pages website labels shock and disbelief, fear and anxiety, denial as symptoms of trauma. And when we look around our country, when we look at the fact that our government buried an apology in an appropriations bill and never once read it, that's not racism. That's trauma. We have states like Oklahoma and Texas passing laws that say you can only teach patriotic history. That's not racism. That's trauma. These are groups of people so overwhelmed with what they've done to become who they are that they can't even bear to look at it anymore. It's too traumatizing. So they have to bury it. They can't talk about these things. One of the deepest conversations our nation has ever had on race was the civil rights movement. Who here has studied the civil rights movement? So what was one of the primary or one of the significant moral authorities that was used throughout the civil rights movement? Why was it argued we should extend rights to people of color, primarily African Americans? Wasn't it our own Declaration of Independence? That came up several times throughout the civil rights movement. It was referenced by leaders, by the public, by the media, as this is why we need to extend these, the rights to our, our citizens of color. 
is our own Declaration of Independence. So as a nation, we never had the conversation that our own Declaration of Independence is a systemically racist document that assumes people of color are less than human, that natives are not included in the group of all. Instead, we just affirmed our own exceptionalism and said we have a great foundation, we just need to live up to it. Even in the deepest dialogue our nation has had on race, we were not able to talk about the doctrine of discovery. It was the same doctrine that allowed our nation to enslave African people, that allowed them to discover and steal land from native peoples. We fought a civil war. We've had a civil rights movement. I've traveled from coast to coast around this country speaking about the doctrine of discovery. I would estimate it's less than 2% of our citizens who have any working knowledge of what the doctrine of discovery actually is. Why have we never talked about it? Why are we not studying it? When Germany lost the war, They passed laws that said they had to teach the Holocaust so they wouldn't repeat it. We've embedded this doctrine into the foundations of our nation, and we've never talked about it. That's not racism. That's trauma. We don't know what to do with this information. We don't know how to have this dialogue. American exceptionalism is a, is a well-talked-about concept within our country. American exceptionalism has two basic tenets. One is a little more religious in nature. It comes from our belief that Americans are God's chosen people, and the continent of North America is our promised land. Now, most people don't use such explicit language, but who's ever heard of the concept of manifest destiny? Yeah. Yeah. That was this belief that this government had the right to rule these lands from sea to shining sea. They had to manifest a divine destiny to conquer and possess and control these lands. Who's heard politicians or has even referenced the the use of a city on a hill? This came from John Winthrop's sermon that he gave at the at the when he first landed in Boston. It was called the Mall of Christian Charity. And in this sermon, he compared the colonists to a city on a hill, a light to the world, which was referencing Jesus teaching to his disciples to tell them to go out and be a light to the world. And he goes on in that sermon and basically exhorts the people that they're about ready to cross. They've crossed over this vast sea and they're going into their promised land to take possession of it, just like the people of Israel did when they crossed the Jordan River to go into Canaan. There's another tenet of American exceptionalism, which is a little more secular in nature. This tenet deals with the fact that we're a nation that's not founded on a shared history. We're a nation of immigrants. But we're founded on a common ideology. Seymour Martin Lipset identifies our common ideologies as liberty, egalitarianism, individualism, populism, and laissez-faire. Abraham Lincoln addresses this at the end of the Gettysburg Address where he talks about um, we have a government of the people, for the people, and by the people, and it shall not perish from the earth. It's influenced, these, these ideologies are influenced in the preamble of the U.S. Constitution, which says we, the people of the U.S., in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common deference promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our our posterity to ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. There's this belief that the United States of America is not founded on a common history, but on a common ideology. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. But we don't talk about the implicit racial bias that comes with both of these arguments. So who here has read the book of Joshua? This is the book of the people of Israel going into Canaan to take possession of their promised lands, correct? 
what happens to the Canaanites? What's the command? Kill them, right? It's God-ordained genocide. Promised lands for one people is literally genocide for another group of people. We never talk about that. But if you lay the history of the United States over the story of Israel going into Canaan, the similarities are eerie. With the second tenet of American exceptionalism, we talk about this common ideology, but we don't talk about the implicit racial bias that says people of color are less than human. The Declaration of Independence clearly states that Native Americans are not included in the group of all. The Constitution clearly states that Natives and African Americans are not included in the citizenship of this nation. This Constitution was not developed for them. They were excluded from it. The implicit racial bias of our country is that people of color are less than human and are not included in the group of all. And we don't talk about this. But we need to. Because I would say the myth of American exceptionalism has become a coping mechanism for a nation in deep denial of its systemic racial reality, racist reality. We cling to this myth because we don't know what to do with the fact that our foundations are so incredibly messed up. We don't know what to do with it. So we deny it and claim that we're exceptional nonetheless. This past year, this past six months, there have been two world leaders who have spoken to joint sessions of our Congress. The first was Benjamin Netanyahu last spring, and the last was Pope Francis just a few weeks ago. It's very interesting what both of these world leaders had to say when they addressed the Congress of the United States of America. Benjamin Netanyahu was here because he was very afraid of this deal that our nation was negotiating with Iran. And he's very afraid for the security of his country. And so he came to basically lobby our Congress and, and encourage them not to pass this deal. And as he spoke to our members of our Congress, he said to them, and he wanted an argument that would basically bring both sides of a deeply divided Congress together. Something that would unify them under a common belief, a common vision, a common understanding of who they were. And so with the big, towards the beginning of his speech, he said, because America and Israel, we share a common destiny. The destiny of promised lands. Now, does anyone here really believe that the Prime Minister of Israel truly believes that you and me share in the sacred covenant covenant that God established with the nation of Israel. Does anyone really believe that? Or is he merely an extremely wise and shrewd politician who knows very well the implicit bias of his audience? And so he basically says, you have promised lands too. Now what this does is it justifies our past. You have promised lands. Don't worry about the genocide. Don't worry about the stolen lands. Don't worry about your history and what you've done. It's all okay. You have promised lands. You have a God-ordained mandate to take this land and this nation by force. In 1452, we went over what Pope Nicholas said regarding indigenous peoples and Muslims, he dehumanized them and began laying the foundation for a doctrine of discovery. Over 500 years later, one of his successors, Pope Francis, a man who is probably the most gutsy prophet I've seen in my lifetime. I mean, the guy's driving through our country, thumbing his nose at big oil as he cruises around in his little fiat. 
you know, the guy, like, he, he, has, he has guts. He's not afraid to stand up to anybody. Just a few months ago when he was in Bolivia, a nation that has an indigenous president, he actually used words of apology to the indigenous peoples of, of South America and talked about the tragedy of what happened to the indigenous peoples of these nations and used language of apology. And so there was this expectation of what was he going to say to our Congress during the joint session? How was he going to address them? What was he going to say? What was he going to do to challenge this nation that has taken this doctrine of discovery and ran with it farther than any other nation in the world has done? And he stood in front of our Congress and he addressed the history about how tragic it was. And then he said, but it's difficult to judge the past by the criteria of the present. He said to our Congress, it's okay. Yeah, you did some horrible things. It's okay. We're not going to judge you. We can't judge the past by the criteria of the present. It's very interesting that in the last six months, two world leaders have addressed the United States Congress and both felt compelled to appease white guilt. Both felt compelled to tell our leaders, it's okay. We're not going to judge you. You get a pass on this one. You have promised lands. We're not going to use the criteria of the present to judge your past actions. Our nation is in deep, deep denial. We're in a lot of pain. And our trauma is becoming more and more apparent. So much that even world leaders are addressing it when they speak to our leaders. So what do we do? What do we do? How do we move this dialogue forward? How do we find healing in the midst of all this pain and this incredibly deep denial? There's an Aboriginal leader from Canada who says, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no true community. Where community is to be formed, common memory must first be created. I think this quote gets to the heart of our nation's problem with race. As a country, we have no common memory. We have a dominant culture that remembers discovery, opportunity, economic advancement. And we have communities of color that have the lived realities of slavery, stolen lands, broken treaties, cultural genocide, internment camps. And there's no common memory. We have to find a way to create this common memory. Canada just recently had what they call the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Several years ago, some boarding school survivors from the residential schools in Canada brought a lawsuit against the churches and the state. And the, the, the government and the churches ended up settling the lawsuit. And one of the agreements of the lawsuit was that the government would issue a formal apology to the First Nations people for the history of residential schools. And it was also uh, stated that a Truth and Reconciliation Commission would be started and would go across the, can the nation of Canada addressing these stories and these issues and giving platform to other boarding school survivors to come up and tell their stories. So in 2008, the Prime Minister stood in the House of Commons and from that floor spoke a very eloquent and very public apology to the native peoples of Canada. And then this commission for six years traveled throughout the country, stopping at different cities and different places all around the country, allowing the indigenous peoples to come forward and share their stories and allowing the governments and the churches in those areas to come forward and make commitments and promises of reconciliation. I s attended one of these meetings up in Edmonton. And for a long time, because I knew about the apology that our government had given and the way it was buried deep within this appropriations bill, I knew that our, our country was nowhere near ready for truth and reconciliation. Because you can't reconcile if no one can admit they've done anything wrong. And our nation is nowhere near ready at an institutional level to admit they've done something wrong. So reconciliation in this country is not possible at this moment. But in Canada, what really struck me is that almost every survivor that came forward 
had a very similar story. And it went something like this. Usually it was a mother or a, a father about my age, maybe even younger, and they would come forward and say, my, I've never told this story. Our family has never told this story. But my, grandfather, my grandmother was put in a residential school, and she was raped and beaten and abused. And so she abused my mother, and my mother abused me. And I'm here today sharing this story for the first time because I have a small baby myself, and the abuse is going to stop with me. I'm going to tell this story so I can begin my own journey of healing, so I will not pass this historical trauma on to my children and my grandchildren. And I heard that over and over and over again. And I thought, this is what our nation needs. If our institutions can't admit they've done anything wrong, we can at least give platform to the survivors of these historical traumas and allow them to begin this journey of healing, to begin sharing their stories, to begin letting the truth out, and even to begin to address the trauma of our dominant culture. This sin, this abuse, this injustice that's been buried so deep we can't even stand to look or think or talk about it anymore. But we can bring that out into the open. And so I began to dream and pray and think about what if our nation had a truth commission? We can't get to reconciliation yet. We'll worry about that later. Let's start with just telling the truth. And what if we didn't start it at the institutional level? What if we started at the grassroots level? In December 19 of 2012, I hosted a public reading of the U.S. Apology to Native Peoples in front of the Capitol building. I spent a year traveling throughout the country talking about this, writing about it, inviting people to come and join me. We had maybe 150, 200 people show up, and they were almost entirely from the grassroots level. Even though I had invited senators and presidents and leaders of denominations and business leaders and academic leaders, almost none of those people came. But we had almost 200 people from the grassroots. And one of the things I've realized as I've traveled throughout the country is I'm not convinced. Actually, I, I, I'll phrase it the other way. I am convinced most Americans are not overtly racist. But we live in a systemically racist nation with systemically racist institutions. But the problem is, is when you live in a system that is systemically racist, anti-racism has very little to do with your personal racist views. When you live in an institution that's systemically racist, anti-racism is all about your willingness to change the system. And that's what we need to do. We have to change the system. And so I've been speaking and talking about laying out this vision from the grassroots level. What if we were to have a truth commission? What if we were to invite everyday citizens like you and me to this table? What if we were to give platform to survivors of these injustices and allow them to share the truth? What if we were able to teach extensively about what the doctrine of discovery is and how it's influenced our nation to its very core? What would happen? I want to share with you the, the, just the first few paragraphs of an article that I wrote, and I'm going to end with this. It's on my website. The full article is called The Doctrine of Discovery, A Buried Apology in an Empty Chair. And I want to just read the first few paragraphs of this article for you. Picture a chair, an empty chair. There are dozens, even hundreds of them, sitting on the stage behind the podium. At the microphone is a Native American elder, hurting, trembling, shaking, but standing. Full of resolve, sharing a story of the horrors of the abuse, neglect, and trauma experienced as a young child at an Indian boarding school. In front of this elder are hundreds, even thousands of people, Native Americans with their heads bowed in grief, sorrow, even panic as their own memories of similar stories are triggered. African Americans sitting silently, staring at the ground as they recall stories 
of the trauma their ancestors endured as slaves, the free labor force of an emerging nation. Americans of European descent sitting uncomfortably, even squirming, their eyes wide open and their hearts pounding as they hear stories of a history they've spent a lifetime denying existed. Over the meal, even though the seating is open, the tables are largely segregated and the room is unusually quiet. Food is eaten, napkins are folded, and the garbage is dumped as everyone solemnly returns to the room where more stories of a similar nation are, nature are shared. This process is repeated the next day and the next. Some of the voices are angry, some are broken, some are resentful, but a few are hopeful. As the days progress and more and more stories are shared, subtle changes begin to take place. The room is opened up to create more space. The storytellers are standing taller. The audience is beginning to make eye contact. The lunch and dinner tables are noticeably less segregated. There is more conversation, and the stage behind the podium, a few of the empty chairs, are now occupied. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I just wanted to remind you before you leave that there will be another session tonight at 7.30 over in SB 1606. Mr. Charles will be leading this session titled The Doctrine of Discovery, A Call to Lament. I hope to see you all there. Have a great day.